Gotcha. I am Hanif James and I am the writer and director for A Shade of Indigo. So my name is Nadine Rawlins and I am the producer and director of Paralytic. Hi, my name is Gemma McFarlane. I'm the director of Time to Go, a Jeff the Propeller short film. And lose that diffusion that's meaning of Outside of the fact that the story um, means a lot to me because of its theme of acceptance and um, you know, not just the LGBTQ community, but all of us really who feel some form of oppression because of societal reasons. That's why this story means a lot to me and I just want uh, people to connect with the character that um, Malin has developed. Um, you know, humanizing people who have to go through these kind of struggles. My name is Malin Lowe and I'm the writer of Paralytic and also the art department. This story uh, came from a conversation I was eavesdropping on about 10 years ago. So it's based on a true crime actually that was never reported or solved. I am Carl Davis and I play the bartender. Uh, when we're doing film, you know you have to rehearse and get it checked so you get the right stuff. I am Afia Beni and my role is Scully. It's been very challenging to integrate into this character, but it also is exciting because I get to see a new part of me in a kind of way. Hi, my name is Afia Richards and I play the big sister Andean on A Shade of Indigo. I was very nervous because they had me, <laughs> they had a scene for me that I had to cry and I didn't know how I was going to go about doing that, but um, all in all, it was good. Um, everyone is fun, everyone's um, nice to be around. It's, it's awesome. I'm glad to be a part of this project. Hi, my name is Tanya Batson-Savage and I am the producer of A Shade of Indigo. From script, it's a beautiful story. The director had wonderful reasons for wanting to make this story and anyone who lives in contemporary Jamaica knows that this is it's high time we spoke about this very important topic. Today's scene is one of the only VFX shots that we have uh, for most of the film we're doing practical effects choreography whatever so for this scene our character has blanked out and as such what's represented in their mind is this beautiful white space. Hi, my name is Dane Nelson and I am the DP for Time To Go. The idea is not necessarily to look like it's natural. It needs to look unreal, like she's, sur she's not really surrounded by white. You know, it started about three years ago and so when we got the opportunity to to submit to JAFTA, it was like, you know, it was, it, it was ready. Well, we were ready. We thought we were ready, but we weren't really ready <laughs> because we had to go through so much process in terms of getting the script ready, um, getting the work in general ready. The workshop process was amazing. I learned so much. A lot of workshopping went into this project. Of course, we did several rewrites and there were lots of discussions and I learned so much. I'm really grateful for it. The writing process is extensive and getting the writing done was something that was both explorative but also um, introspective. There were long sessions and there was a lot, lot, lot of information that I have in a notebook that I'm pretty sure I will be consulting for a while yet to come. The exercise of creating the script and then, you know, going through it with the producers and trying to go through visuals and dialogue and everything was just a lot of work. Um, just getting involved with an association that has projects like, you know, Propeller, um, because it's, you know, it's developmental. And so I think it's so important once you are, once you have made that decision to do filmmaking, you know, to seek the development that is required so that you can be better at what you do. I think this initiative is important because it helps to um, discover and showcase um, so many talented Jamaicans and so many talented individuals that are living here in Jamaica who ha are aware of their talent or yet to become aware of their talent. So I think it's important because they help to shed light on that. That's a wrap! <laughs>
Best Jamaica 2022. Confirm. All right, cool. Slit. Scene two, take one. Mark. So you see, if you look on her right now, right. you see she'll open it properly. Say, come on, 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 come shooting a small film. I'm a part-time actor for today and I'm helping to direct, also helping with doing some photographs, some lighting, some all of that. So we're just here learning and it's been a great experience so far. It's been good so far. I'm learning something new, something that I didn't think that I would be learning. The most exciting part for me today is seeing the whole setup for the scenes. I would like to be an actor and this is going to give me a first hand experience of what it's going to be like to be on a set. The most exciting part for me today is to be an extra and it's been great. The scenes, the expressions, all of that, <laughs> I fell in love with it. Alright, stand by. I'm out, I'm out just got to go run through. So just remember, so when you walk up, when you do your first film, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to show that you're doing something. What happened now is that the next time you make a film, you're supposed to see the mark improvement. Every time you create something, it's supposed to elevate, you understand? It's been a good experience. I've learned about film production and all of the process it takes to make a film. And the person within the field that wants to train other youngsters that are interested, so they'll be under good guidance and good leadership. I would like to thank Jeff for this tremendous experience and us meeting these awesome people and us having a great day. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here, to have so a lot of fun, meet some new, new friends, new people, and I hope you guys continue doing this wonderful job. Big, big ups to Jafta. Jafta and UNICEF, big up. Like it's, been a, it's been a great opportunity for me personally, and I just want to tell anybody that's interested, to give it a go. I have to say I'm thankful to Jafta and the Spotlight Initiative for giving me the chance to experience today. I am Hanif James and I am the writer and director for A Shade of Indigo. So my name is Nadine Rawlins and I am the producer and director of Paralytic. Hi, my name is Gemma McFarlane. I'm the director of Time to Go, or just a propeller short film. And lose that diffusion that's moving up. Outside of the fact that the story um, means a lot to me because of its theme of acceptance and, um, you know, not just the LGBTQ community, but all of us really who feel some form of oppression because of societal reasons. That's why this story means a lot to me and I just want uh, people to connect with the character that um, Malin has developed. Um, you know, humanizing people who have to go through these kind of struggles. My name is Malin Lowe and I'm the writer of Paralytic and also the art department. This story uh, came from a conversation I was eavesdropping on about 10 years ago. So it's based on a true crime actually that was never reported or solved. I am Carl Davis, and I play the bartender. Well, when we're doing film, you know you have to rehearse and get it checked, so you get the right stuff. 
I am Afia Benny and my role is Scully. It's been very challenging to integrate into this character, but it also is exciting because I get to see a new part of me in a kind of way. Hi, my name is Afia Richards and I play the big sister Andine on A Shade of Indigo. I was very nervous because they had me, <laughs> they had a scene for me that I had to cry and I didn't know how I was going to go about doing that, but um, all in all, it was good. Um, everyone is fun, everyone's um, nice to be around. It's, it's awesome. I'm glad to be a part of this project. Hi, my name is Tanya Batson savage and I am the producer of A Shade of Indigo. From script, it's a beautiful story. The director had wonderful reasons for wanting to make this story. And anyone who lives in contemporary Jamaica knows that this is, it's high time we spoke about this very important topic. Today's scene is one of the only VFX shots that we have. Uh, for most of the film, we're doing practical effects, choreography, whatever. So for this scene, our character has blanked out and as such, what's represented in their mind is this beautiful white space. Hi, my name is Dave Nelson and I am the DP for Time To Go. The idea is not necessarily to look like it's natural. It needs to look unreal, like she's, sur she's not really surrounded by white. You know, it started about three years ago and so when we got the opportunity to, to submit to JAFTA, it was like, you know, it was, a, it was ready. Well, we were ready, we thought we were ready, but we weren't really ready. <laughs> because we had to go through so much process in terms of getting the script ready, um, getting the work in general ready. The workshop process was amazing, I learned so much. A lot of workshopping went into this project. Of course, we did several rewrites and there were lots of discussions and I learned so much. I'm really grateful for it. The writing process is extensive and getting the writing done was something that was both explorative but also um, introspective. There were long sessions and there was a lot, lot, lot of information that I have in a notebook that I'm pretty sure I will be consulting for a while yet to come. The exercise of creating the script and then, you know, going through it with the producers and trying to go through visuals and dialogue and everything was just a lot of work. Um, just getting involved with an association that has projects like, you know, Propeller, um, because it's, you know, it's developmental. And so I think it's so important once you are, once you have made that decision to do filmmaking, you know, to seek the development that is required so that you can be better at what you do. I think this initiative is important because it helps to um, discover and showcase um, so many talented Jamaicans and so many talented individuals that are living here in Jamaica who ha are aware of their talent or yet to become aware of their talent. So I think it's important because they help to shed light on that. That's a wrap! <laughs>
has administered and executed by JAFTA with funding, was administered and executed by JAFTA, sorry, with funding and mentorship and collaborative support from Ms. Porter Christie. Grants of 1,000 USD were awarded to maximum two selected screenwriters. And this year we partnered with Judalina Nero, executive producer, and Kevin Avery, Kevin Avery Emery, sorry, Emmy winning and writer producer as the mentors. In the theme of paying it forward, on completion of their fellowship, the awardees would be required to participate in at least one public sharing session, one mentorship session, and at least one community outreach initiative to apply the learning and the knowledge that they got. The special thing about the big pitch is that it's a competition and whoever has the best pitch at the end of this program will get 8,000 USD. And fortunately, both contestants will be allowed to meet with execs after. So once again, thank you for coming. I would like to throw to Leslie and Wanlis just to give us a little bit of information of how this process was. Hi, sorry guys. All right. Um, my name is Vesna Mondes. I am the business development and the training chairperson for JAFTA. Uh, I think um, Sai kind of covered a lot of what uh, the episodics and the fellowship was, you know, just initial selection of these of our two fellows. Um, we had a, a submission um, of about 10 or 12 uh, episodics, um, projects, sorry. Um, and from that, we selected um, two fellows, um, two projects, the two projects that we'll be pitching today. And then they underwent a five-month mentorship program. Um, and this mentorship program was guided, as I said, by or the founder of the initiative and the collaborator with uh, with JAFTA, Aisha Porter Christie, thank you very much, um, who is also a the writer and director and uh, currently a consulting producer on Marvel and Disney's upcoming series, Daredevil Born Again. She's also the co-executive producer on The Boys spin-off, Gen V, and a supervising producer on Greg Berl Berlanti, Berlanti and the Julie Plex, the girls on the bus. The finalists were also mentored, as um, as I also said, by um, Kevin Avery, who's a comedian and two-time Emmy Award winning writer, and Judalina Nira, a producer and writer known for The Flash, Hit the Floor and Do No Harm, co-executive producer on a forthcoming spin-off of, of Amazon The Boys, and an Emmy-nominating super um, supervising producer. The JAFTA Porter Christie Episodic Fellowship is in its second year and remains a vested partner with, with JAFTA and Aisha Porter around the development of episodic content. So we look forward to sending out a call again soon and for all of you to just submit your, your, your scripts and for us to repeat this process again. Thank you. Yeah, respect, Leslie. Um, so before we hear from Aisha, I just want to throw to a director from the Ministry of Culture, Enter Entertainment and Sports, Tajana Richards. Tajana, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Cool. You have the floor. Are you hearing me? Yes, we are. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Tajana Richards, Director of Entertainment Policy and Monitoring at the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport. Now, it is my pleasure to bring greetings from the Ministry on this lovely Sunday afternoon, as the Ministry has since the inception of JAFTA supported financially and through facilitation, the projects emanated from this important industry association. Whether the Propeller Series, which has been our most long-standing support, along with the Chase Fund, 
support for script writing workshops, support for creatives travel to festivals or otherwise, the Ministry of Culture has been a constant in supporting industry building. This is why I'm pleased to congratulate JAFTA on this, their latest industry developmental initiative, JAFTA Episodic, that focuses on episodic content. This was launched during COVID in 2020. That was, particular, that was a particularly isolating period of lockdown. When there was tremendous need for content, the program is combined with the, with the Porter Screenwriting Fellowship, thanks to the philanthropy of Aisha Porter Christie, who believed in helping JAFTA members develop scripted Jamaican content for TV pilots and web series. LA-based and Jamaican screenwriter and producer Asia Porter Christie, in her generosity in this iteration, has given grants of $1,000 to two participants, and the winner of today receives $8,000. It is our hope that the recipients will in turn provide support to others by sharing what they have learned. So we are pleased at these developmental programs that are undertaken by industry associations and private capital. They are a measure of the health of the creative sectors as government provides the enabling environment for the private sector and industry associations and NGOs to come together. I have five minutes, so I'll stop here, but I wish the participants, the sponsors, and the mentors, Judalina Nero, please forgive me for my pronunciation, and Kevin Avery, and of course, Jafta, for being a conduit. All the success in this program, guys. Thank you so much, Tajana. So, around eight years ago, I was working at a place called Face Reproductions, and I saw a, a lady or a young lady with very long, beautiful locks come in. And I was like, wow, who is this? This has to be like the best looking intern ever. And we met and it was the one behold, Aisha. Little did I know that I would have been, she would have introduced me to filmmaking in such a way uh, my first experience with audio on film was for her short that she did in Jamaica. And also, little did I know that she would have had, she would have had such a major impact on the industry. So Aisha, I just want to big you up. I want to give you a special shout out, special thank you on behalf of the Jamaica Film and Television Association. We are very proud of you and we are very happy that of the way that you've decided to give back to the industry. Aisha Porter Christie is a Jamaican screenwriter and producer working mainly out of Los Angeles. She's written on a variety of television shows in both the US and Canada, and is currently a consulting producer on Marvel Studios' upcoming series, Daredevil, Born Again for Disney Plus. So just turn to Aisha so she can just give her some of her remarks. I was not prepared for that special shout out. I feel very emotional right now. Uh, thank you, Saeed. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to start by saying a huge thank you to Jafta for being my partner in crime over the last two years of staging this fellowship. We started back in 2020 during the height of the pandemic, and it's been a real labor of love. You know, I'll never forget how much of a struggle it was for me to get a foot in the door of the North American industry. And it made me pretty frustrated that screenwriting still wasn't a viable career in Jamaica in spite of the immense pool of talent that's currently available. And I wanted to do my part to give Jamaican writers additional access to, you know, mentorship, training, and also a little bit of financial support, which comes in the form of the thousand dollar award that's presented to each of our fellowship winners. This year, I am so proud and excited to say that the fellowship has gotten bigger and better starting 
connecting with our incredible mentors we've talked about like Judalina is one of my dear friends I worked on two shows with her and served under her while she was the governor of the television academy which is the organization that stages the Emmys every year and Kevin Avery or comedy guru who has worked across late night sitcoms and animation and has just made this entire process a really hilarious joy to be a part of um, our fellows worked closely with Kevin and Judalina to polish their pilot scripts and to develop a series pitch, which they will be presenting to our panel of esteemed judges today. And this time around, they'll be competing for eight thousand U.S. dollars in development funds towards producing those projects. The judging rubric for today is as follows: originality, twenty percent; characters, twenty percent; pilot story, twenty percent series potential, 20%, and overall presentation, 20%. So thank you all so much for joining us. I'm so excited about this year's projects, and I look forward to seeing more Jamaican screenwriters making their mark. Thank you so much, Aisha. And speaking of esteemed judges, uh, let me just introduce you to who is on our judges panel today. Starting with Scott Stoops and... Please, guys, take time with me. These are very important people. So them bio a little bit long because they have so, so, such a big CV. So Scott Stoops started at Good Fair Content as a manager. Now as a partner at the company, he represents writers and directors in both TV and film. Clients in, include Megan McDonnell, who was the first writer in on the Marvels and was on the staff of WandaVision, Agatha, and Apple's Dark Matter. Raina McClendon, who is currently writing The Dark Side as a matter, sorry, as a series for Netflix, as well as working in the Star Wars universe. Our very own Aisha Porter Christie, who is on the Marvel's Daredevil staff while writing Clifton for Peacock. The Lincoln Lawyers, Zach Kalig. I hope I'm not betraying these names. Poker Faces Wyatt Kane and Rohit Kumar, who is running a yet to be announced series for Netflix. Scott also serves as a supervising producer on the Peacock series Hysteria, which was written by his client, Matthew Scott Kane. So Scott, if you can just open your mic and just give us a few remarks, we'd appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for the introduction. You pronounce everyone's names perfectly. Uh, I'm Scott. I'm uh, so blessed and lucky to get to work with Aisha and talk to her almost every day. Um, I have uh, was a part of this program uh, the last time in, in 2020 and am uh, grateful to have been asked back. Um, I think it's such a cool opportunity and organization, and I'm really excited to hear what uh, what what's in store for us today so thanks so much for having me and um i uh i'm excited to be here thank you so much scott so next we have cecile emiki once again my apologies feel free to correct me with after cecile cecile emiki is a director writer and artist from london with a body of work that spans broadcast television independent film and visual art well known for her versatility and dexterity, she has directed and written for broadcasters such as HBO, BBC, and Sky, as well as received film and moving image commissions from the Tate Modern, ICA Dazed, amongst others. Cecile is particularly well known for her globally acclaimed documentary series, Strolling, which recorded conversations with people across the Black diaspora, as well as Aki and Saltfish. Her widely regarded comedy short film turned web series that followed the relatable and everyday happenings of two best friends. So welcome, Cecile. Hi, thank yeah. you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to hear the two pictures today and it's really an honor to be a part of this fellowship. It's great what you guys are doing. So yeah, thank you for having me. And thank you so much for being here, Cecile. So I'd like to move on to Rukayat Giwa. Rukayat is a television scripted and intellectual property rights agent at CAA. Rukayat began her career teaching high school math in Metro Atlanta, Georgia through Teach for America after graduating from UC Berkeley. 
She joined CAA in 2017 after graduating from the University of South California with a degree in producing for film, television, and new media, MFA, from the Peter Stark Producing Program. So welcome, Rukat. Thank you for being here. Any remarks? Yeah. Thank you. Like the rest of the panel, I'm really grateful to be here to listen to the pitches from the fellows and lucky to be working with Aisha with Scott as well, too. Great. We definitely appreciate you being here. And let's move on to our local judges. We have Kia McIntosh. Kia McIntosh is a graduate of the Howard University in the BA in Film Production, LEAD. Sorry. A graduate of the Howard University with a BA in Film Production, led Kia to a path in television via an internship at BET. With over 15 years of work experience in programming, production and television operations at notable TV networks internationally and regionally, specifically BET International, WGBH Educational, Boston's PBS affiliate, cable operator Ready TV and productions from numerous brand, brands behind, mostly behind the scenes. Her master's in project management from Boston University provided the, school, provided the tools and skills to implement in her production planning. Kia has an overall understanding of the TV landscape and the hard work and commitment it takes to get each project going. Now the head of programming at CVM TV, she has a responsibility of the 24-7 operations of multiple channels, as well as acquisitions and development of content in Jamaica for the diaspora. Over to you, Kim. Hi, thank you so much for that. I am happy to be here, um, mostly because this is exactly the type of uh, environment that I moved back to Jamaica for, um, content development being a part of the development of Jamaican talent and artists to have the exposure to more eyeballs. So this is an exciting experience and I'm really proud to be a part of the judges panel. Nice. Thanks, Kio. And finally, Storm Salter. Storm Salter is a filmmaker and multidisciplinary artist from Negril, Jamaica. His award-winning debut film, Better Must Come, was hailed by critics as signaling a fresh new movement of independent filmmaking throughout the Caribbean. Storm has also directed music videos from Sean Paul and Sia, Chronix, Arcade Fire, Protégé and Popcorn, and captured visuals for Beyonce and Jay-Z's On The Run to World Tour. As a commercial director, he has worked with athletes like Usain Bolt and brands like Puma and Red Stripe and he received a 2021 Gold Addy Award for directing the Jack Daniels Culture Shakers campaign. His second feature film, Sprinter, swept the 2018 American Black Film Festival winning Best Director, Best Narrative Feature, and the Audience Award. It is currently streaming on Hulu. Over to you, Storm. Hey, everybody, respect. Um, there's literally a lightning storm going on where I live right now, so that just knocked me off two seconds ago. <laughs> so I had to get back um, to my phone, so hopefully I'm, I'm sorry. But I'm really happy to be here. I'm really excited to hear both of these stories and just to hear from these voices. And I'm excited about the fact y'all are working in, in horror and Caribbean mythology, etc. cetera. And, um, yeah, I'm just super interested. Thanks for having me. And bless up. Good luck. Yeah, give thanks, Storm. And yeah, I just saw a big piece of lightning. So yeah, let's get through this quick. Um, so we're moving on to our first pitch. Now is the time, right? So our first pitch is from Rachel Chin. Rachel Chin is a writer, editor, and historian from Kingston, Jamaica. Her filmmaking journey began as a university student, where she first got involved with DIY productions on campus. She graduated from Columbia University with a BA in History in 2018 and completed her MA in History at McGill University in 2022. 
Between these degrees, she trained as a story editor in the second cohort of the Jamaica Film and Television Association's Feature Film Lab in 2019. Her first feature screenplay, Everyone Gets What They Deserve, was accepted for the 2021 Bahamas International Film Festival Screenwriters Residency. Most recently, she was granted the 2023 Jafta Porter Christie Screenwriting Fellowship. She currently sits on the board of the Women in Film and Television Jamaica as a director of their research, training, and Dev development committee. So, as we get ready for the next pitch, I also want to wish you good luck, Rachel. I know you have this, and over to you. Thank you so much. Hi. So this is uh, my pitch. This is for Something Grave. It's a one-hour dramedy. Um, as someone who spent their whole life beset by visions and um, plagued by inexplicable phenomena, uh, I just decided to ignore it. Uh, I decided whatever message may be beckoning from beyond, it seems like a lot of stress and responsibility I'd have to include in my life, and I just don't have the time or the energy. And uh, even if I choose ignorance, when I, I think about it as a concept, though, I really do feel just sort of bad for a ghost because... I mean, being conscious forever and like dealing with other people for all eternity, it just really seems like, well, personally, I'm just, I'm all for dying, to be honest. And so I am choosing not to believe that ghosts are real, uh, a bit like, you know, the end of the world, you know, which I've been told has been happening for the past seven or so years. But I'm black, so I haven't noticed. Uh, like the world ended for us a long time ago. And, uh, you know, it did get me thinking, you know, with all this in mind, what if death was just like being alive? And um, what if the other world was just more of the same? You know, just waiting in line, paperwork, corporate speak, bullshit. Just what if it was just more pointless, soul crushing mundanity? Wouldn't that be hilarious? Uh, so, Something Grave is an hour long dramedy about two very different sisters as they quarrel over the endless tedium of safeguarding the undead in the face of what might be the apocalypse. It's similar in tone to being human, Los Espookies, and what we do in the shadows. The show is a little bit about ghosts and ghouls, but it's a lot about collective grief and um, whether or not we're all just navigating the afterlife of a world we were all looking forward to. After all, apocalypse is a process and not an event. And it is endless, endless, endless processing. It is the waiting room from Beetlejuice on steroids. It's you take a number, find the right form, find the right line, find the right office. You might not be in hell, but the afterlife turns out to just be a swirling bureaucratic nightmare. And, you know, for the average hapless ghost, the recently departed, you know, there's no reason that you would know what to do with yourself because most people don't even know what to do with themselves when they're alive. And moving on can get really tricky because nobody really knows exactly what you're moving on. Two, so it's easy to understand why anyone would choose a paranormal existence to avoid the great unknown, even if the witches are all committing wire fraud and the vampires talk a lot more about real estate than you'd imagine. But maintaining the balance amongst the living and the dead and the undead requires constant supervision, haunting after haunting, petty grievance after petty grievance, night after night after night after night. And for 23-year-old Mercy, this is all pretty routine. It's more than that. It's like, it's pretty fucking routine. She's basically a park ranger, ranger to the undead. But she has a lot of sympathy for them because, you know, like death, her job is endless. It's final. And it's killing her. If you think a dead person has it bad, imagine having to give the same spiel to every new ghost that crops up. And now imagine it as a young woman in a crowd of touchy, aggro dudes. And now imagine it under your mother's watchful disapproval. And now imagine it without even the choice of whether or not you want to do it or not. Maybe the ability of walking the line between life and death should be a profound and sacred experience, but it's certainly not the reality. This world or this life uh, borders the energetic world of the next. And for souls that get lost moving on, the easiest way to cross over is a gate. And out of the very few capable of perceiving both realms, a handful are known as gatekeepers tasked with watching over anyone yet to move on. But one thing that they all can agree on from the vampires to the werewolves to the witches, that Circle 44J of human gatekeepers are just the worst. Maybe they used to make a real effort to integrate themselves into the paranormal community, but nowadays everybody just thinks of them as a bunch of narcs. 
Uh, it's a hugely paternalistic framework. It's not at all helped by the tight-lipped insular behavior of its members. It's called gatekeeping for a reason. It's not just a thankless job. It's also a joyless, friendless, endless slog. The nights are long and repetitive. The risk of mortal peril is high and the community is fratty and toxic and the bureaucracy just goes on and on without end. And people have been saying this forever, but things have been getting worse lately. The lights in the passport office-esque interim office never used to flicker like that, for one. And the number of energetic disturbances just keep getting more and more frequent. But then addressing that would mean another three-week training seminar and a lot more paperwork for our characters. At the center of this is Mercedes Delacroix at 23. She's the youngest official gatekeeper of Circle 44J. And after five years on the job, Mercy is burned out. She is at her limit. She is on the verge of a nervous breakdown. And her easygoing nature keeps on the borderline of just worsening self-destructiveness. But it wasn't always like this. You know, she used to have friends. She used to have a life. Uh, she used to get sleep, at least. But now all she has is her mother's car, sometimes, the distant memory of leisure and the pathetic hope that just once she will get a night off. Part of the reason for her mental and emotional exhaustion is that she took gate keeping on out of obligation to her family. And this has evolved into like a latent, irritating sense of responsibility towards the undead. But since she's the only one to treat them with any humanity, this puts her squarely on the outside of the oppressive broness of her circle. Mercy's younger half-sister, Jimena Palenque, usually has her back, but this doesn't count for much because she's like 17. She's bold, brash, definitely the youngest child. Jimena has nothing but youthful aplomb when it comes to gatekeeping, which is great, but she could do with some patience or decorum or self-awareness, like basic manners. Ghosts don't like to be referred to as hangers on, it turns out, and it's not polite to uh, refer to uh, werewolves as afflicted to their face, things like that. And since she's not been officially inducted, it, she could learn these skills over time, especially because she's been shadowing Mercy on the weekends. However, Jimena prefers to concentrate her energy on memorizing protocol and legalese more than anything else. Because unlike her older sister, Jimena believes that gatekeeping is a hugely important, deeply serious calling, and she cannot wait to get started, which is why it's so frustrating for her that Mercy seems dead set on keeping her from it. But although Jimena can't wrap her head around it, Mercy's long-term, low-commitment vampire, maybe boyfriend, Wes, he understands. He's been a soul agent since the 1960s, finding the constant violence and bloodshed of general vampire culture distasteful. So Wes will often gently remind Mercy that if something sucks, hit the bricks. It's more complicated than that for her, of course, but he should be a little more mindful of it because even their relationship is just complicated. He's, you know... And an irresistibly sexy vampire boyfriend who will not have sex with you and would not use the term boyfriend. Wes might be thoughtful and caring. He's also extremely repressed and has serious control issues. There's a big mortality gap. And besides, he's afraid that sex with him would probably kill her. But honestly, Mercy wishes. Uh, their involvement, it's a huge sore point between Mercy and her circle. And they use it as evidence of her overly sentimental, emotionally compromised, irrational approach to gatekeeping. Because, you know, to date a paranormal, you'd have to think of them as people. And um, rounding out gatekeeping circle for, for Jay, there are a dozen or so lone wolves with big cop energy, typical action anti-hero types. The circle take great pride in presiding over the undead, sometimes with a point of hubris. There's very little variation amongst them, even though they may think of themselves as individuals. They really do operate as a very mask for mask unit. You know, maybe Raleigh is obsessed with knives. Maybe Fleming always gets his girlfriends accidentally murdered. Maybe Father Kyle is a quasi-genocidal Roman Catholic priest. There's really not much difference between them. All they do is police behavior. The support that they show for each other might be touching if they would allow anyone else just a trace of that same empathy. But they are really out in a community of dead people acting like only they have experienced loss. And both Mercy and Jimena operate in the long shadow of their mother, Moira Delacroix. She's something of a living legend. She's attained the rare distinction of retiring from gatekeeping. If she actually has any intention of stepping back, it remains to be seen. Uh, stony and inscrutable, Moira has managed to garner the sincere respect and admiration of their circle and their community. Though it's hard for anyone to imagine how someone like her raised someone like 
Mercy or Jimena. And both sisters feel the same way because their mother is distant, is cold and exacting. But maybe her disappointment wouldn't be so constant if her standards weren't so impossible. And maybe her standards wouldn't be so impossible if she would just communicate them. But she's a Caribbean mother. Everything they learn about her is piecemeal and bewildering. The only common ground Mercy shares with the circle is that they're all not into the idea of Jimena replacing Moira after her retirement. The circle had their own golden boy in mind, however, Rio Ventura. He's only a little older than Mercy, on probation from a circle in a bigger and more interesting city. But Rio has somehow managed to keep a skip in his step and the light in his eyes. So it's hard to imagine what enticed him to put his name down for consideration because he's just so much different from the other gatekeepers. He likes to play fast and loose, the rules, with morals, with murder, whatever. You name it, he'll try anything once. He's exciting, he's empathetic, he's full of life. And he's also nice to Mercy. Like maybe his ulterior motives, maybe he's sincere, but maybe he's involved in a doomsday cult. He's kind of a wild card like that. And everything comes to a head in the pilot on what feels like just another night on the job. Mercy gets a thin glimmer of hope when she runs into friends from high school in a Section 13 embodied irregular haunting, Ordinance 12B, zombification. And before she and Jimena can handle or dismember the problem, they invite Mercy to a super chill hangback, all of which Jimena finds embarrassing from the name to the normies, which is the unofficial term for regular humans. But wouldn't it just be nice to hang out with people who like you and not just have to ferry ghosts in your sensible four-door sedan to a portal to purgatory all night? Jimena disagrees. There's more important things on the line. This is the night of their mother's retirement party and there's an election to replace her. And with school on summer break, Jimena's convinced she could be the one to take her place. But Mercy hates the idea of nominating her sister because she wants Jimena to enjoy her freedom because Mercy had no choice but to start gatekeeping at 18. And just to make matters worse, as they take their ghosts to gate number 949X8, the sisters run into Wes, Mercy's celibate vampire hookup. He sought Mercy out specifically to file a complaint. Someone's covered his motorcycle with garlic and he trusts only her to handle the racial harassment with sensitivity. Mercy allows Jimena the little treat of guiding her ghost to ordinary filing, but Jimena just lacks people skills and it separates her from her ghosts. And as she tries hunting them down in the interim office, she comes across what looks like a really disturbing and mysterious sigil painted in blood, which, you know, disgusting. And besides, the interim office seems to be dealing with a number of issues. There's been too many reports of energetic disturbances. So even Wes's complaint of a threat of violence, which is Form IX-7, has been deprioritized. And all that means is Mercy will have hell convincing the circle to take it seriously because as far as they're concerned, if it's not on file, it might as well never happened. Besides, there's still more important things like the election. Jimena might seem like a shot in the dark, but if no one else is in the running, maybe she could at least be an official gatekeeper. But you can count on the circle to disappoint. The bros have found their champion, Rio, on probation from another circle in another city. Mercy's convinced Jimena should let it go, but all Jimena hears is that Mercy doesn't think she can do it. And that's exactly the look on Jimena's face when Mercy refuses to nominate her. And even if she is right, because her mother throws Jimena's name in and nobody votes for her, Jimena's gutted. And having already disappointed her sister, Mercy throws a last ditch attempt at reconciliation by calling for an undertaking. So now Jimena and Rio have to compete for the position by resolving a long-standing disturbance in their community. But there's a catch. Rio claims Mercy as a supervisor before Jimena gets the chance. Mercy's not allowed a choice on the basis of favoritism, but it doesn't matter. Neither Jimena nor her mother will drop the fact that Mercy wouldn't nominate her sister. It's not like Jimena wasn't ever going to win, which Jimena still takes very badly. So she doesn't protest against stranding Mercy at home and abandons her sister for her undertaking. And now a long walk away from either the circle or her social plans, Mercy runs through her options. She tries convincing Wes to take her side, maybe even stage a private investigation, but he insists it's too dangerous. And plus he doesn't appreciate being used to rebel against her mom. And Mercy takes offense to that because it's not like he'd even let her. But there's still one more person she can turn to. And surprisingly, Rio understands. 
He sympathizes with Mercy because he knows what it's like to long for a life outside of work. But he's found one and it's been really helpful for him. And if she's interested, he can introduce her. And there are bigger things to worry about, but Mercy doesn't care about more important things. All she wanted was a night out. And so Rio takes her to a shady but excellent party. And finally, finally, Mercy can have a good time. So at this point, she'll go along with anything he says. And who can blame her? He's kind to her and he's kind of hot. It's nice. So he's so excited to show her what's at the center of the festivities, but Mercy comes across it on her own. It's the ghost who may have failed to take to ordinary filing. She doesn't understand what's happening. He doesn't know what he's doing down here, what's going on. And even if she finally has proved that Jimena is unfit for gatekeeping, there are, again, more important things at stake. And this is something Wes learns kind of intimately off on his own adventure. But this, uh, this is all part of a grander design and a bizarre experiment. Rio lets Mercy in on the secret of the Mystery Collective. They're trying to conquer death. And meanwhile, Jimena and Moira uncover the mystery of the sigil. Someone is trying to start the apocalypse. And so maybe it's a coincidence, but it's a big one. But neither Mercy nor Jimena are going to let the other in. But before either sister can figure anything out, there's still the undertaking to think about. And as the series progresses, the sisters become more and more estranged as long-standing family drama comes to light. And Mercy has to learn how to navigate her relationships with Russ and Rio. And she struggles to balance her responsibilities to her community and to herself. She's got a lot on her plate, so it takes her a while to notice that she's joined a cult slash multi-level marketing scheme devoted to starting the apocalypse. And so the takeaway of something grave is that although people are hardwired to want to take care of each other, we construct these elaborate, ridiculous systems and structures that make it impossible to do just that. And even in the face of the nonsense of the world, it's also impossible to get beyond it because that means losing everything you know and value and cherish. And it is a loss and loss has to be felt. Though, to be fair, I don't think anyone has ever learned to contend with endings as final and inevitable fact of life. Maybe we'll change a lot about our priorities and the way we treated each other before we got to the very end. And with each of the past few years bringing new and exciting reasons to mourn, and the more that I've had to contend with being a young person in the face of unprecedented times, I really wanted to explore that huge um, joint societal feeling of grief and despair and placelessness and purposelessness that I've had to grow up under. And so in this sense, it's not really a coming of age so much as it is an eternal on becoming. And the real question at the heart of something grave is, do you even enjoy being alive? Thank you. Nice. A round of applause for Rachel and her project something grave. Amazing, Rachel. All right. So before we move on to the other pitch, I'm opening the floor to the judges for any questions that you want to ask. Um, I have a question. Uh, first, great pitch. I love the title. I think it's hilarious. And your uh, intro was amazing. Um, <laughs> okay, so you might have explained this, and I apologize if I missed it, but she, uh, Mercy lives in, like, the real world and is alive and then works in purgatory. How does, is that how it works? So most things occur in the real world. It's like um, the idea is that when somebody dies, their spirit ordinarily should just move on to the next whatever is waiting beyond this life but a ghost is someone who gets stuck and her job is to sort of take them to the gate which is the closest part where both of the worlds meet but so uh, nobody knows what's beyond the gate but you have to get there to get through it and that's her job is to make sure that people who are ready to move on can find it and once you get to the gate, is that when you go through all the paperwork and processing and stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then she works in in a circle. Is that like the what like the gate team is called? Uh, the circle, yeah. Okay. Um, cool. Really cr creative and interesting. I thank you. I just uh, wanted to make sure I got the world building down. Thanks, Hi, 
Oh, Hi, I had a I had a question about the episode to episode. Would it be that they're helping people each episode and they those characters fall by the wayside, or really more like an overarching like this few individuals will be helping them across the line over the course of the season? So for the first few episodes, it's going to be um, incidents to incidents, so we can I guess like the audience can get a real sense of the kind of work that they do all the time. But the overarching um, issue is that I think for the first half of the season, it's building towards um, the choice between Rio and Jimena as the next gatekeeper. So um, Moira and Jimena are trying to uncover the mystery of the apocalypse while Mercy and Rio are trying to start it. So they basically diverge as the the first um, half of the series progresses. I, I wanted to ask just, a, a, just for some more clarity on the world. So, because when you were speaking, I was imagining, are we in a, like, almost like a parallel world of the dead and everyone is, or, or are we in the real world, like Scott asked, and you're mm-hmm. just bringing people to the verge of the undead world? Um, is that correct? And also, like, do they see ghosts? You know, if you're alive and then there's someone who has died but hasn't moved on, is that is a is alive people can see these ghosts and shepherd them? That's the little... um yeah. So yeah, the, the you were correct. So we're in the normal world and it's their job to take them to where the, the gate is, which is right before the next the next world. Um but most normal people in the world cannot perceive ghosts. So very, very few people can, and an even slimmer number of people are interested in gatekeeping because it's just, you know, a, it's a lot of responsibility. So. Thank you. Yeah, great. I really, I really enjoyed it. I wanted to ask more about the family dynamic. You mentioned um, the responsibility or the Caribbean mother that is going to be um, retiring. And Mm -hmm. so obviously there's a small community of people that are aware of this gatekeeping circle and the whole paranormal elements, the vampires, the witches, all of those things are are exposed in this community. And I guess their responsibility is to ensure that other persons are not being uh, you know the gatekeeping, which is the the passing over of the persons that need to get to the gate, but then also is a gatekeeping of letting normies not be aware of this entire world that exists in mm-hmm. in parallel to them as well. Right, that's exactly right. Okay, but yeah, I still wanted to to. I guess that would happen in the episodics, but um, mm-hmm. with regards to the mom t- handing over the torch essentially um will we get more exp- ex- more obviously the relationship between the the daughters and the mom will be explored more and why they have this 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 uh that how much of that would we get in those first couple of episodes or is it just um, that the pilot that kind of just explains what that dynamic is and then they move on to the the their stories their diverse diverging stories right <laughs> Uh, no, that's a great question. Um, so the the family is like really the central, um, I guess, like the emotional core of the story is the fact that Jimena and her uh, and Mercy they they bicker a lot, but they really do care about each other. Jimena is usually the only person to have Mercy's back, even if she's not officially a gatekeeper. And Mercy really cares about her sister's agency and you know um, freedom of choice and. Um, and they both also know what it's like to have their mom as their mom. So it's, you know, she's a really sort of, even to them, just like a really just um, incomprehensible person. And it's like, uh, even though you are family and you're supposed to be close, you are constantly learning things about each other. And it's almost like, you know, when you get so close to someone that you can, can't even really see them anymore. There's like the, um, there's there's a lot of there's like the power dynamic of it. There's you know I guess you know when you have sisters or siblings, it's always just you know an issue of personality like who can get along better with what parent. And there's the added complication of the fact that um, they're half sisters, so it's a blended family. You know there's just there's different um, things that I'm both of them 
had access to growing up because of their um, circumstances. So, you know, I think um, Mercy and Jimena really are the, the most important uh, relationship in the story. And because they're sisters, you know, their relationship to each other and their relationship to their mother is a really, it's a really central aspect of, of what's happening. Amazing pitch. It was really like super interesting. Um, I had two questions. One was just like, had do you have anywhere specific where this family is placed in the real world? So is it Jamaica? Is it North America? So I'd be interested to hear more about that. And then also just curious about like how you're visually imagining this. Um, like tonally, like is it high sci-fi? Where like as soon as you know it, when we see this, is it? um visually something that's very distinct and abstract or is it something that's like more contemporary like magical realism kind of side of things um just interested to hear more about that side of things um that's a great question i i way i imagined the world is just like i kind of flattened everything into like region so they're somewhere in north america their family is somewhere from the caribbean um because it is just like a really big to be honest, it's a really big immigration allegory. You know, it's like having this like population of people that are just so um, closely like, controlled by like, you know, really in, like incomprehensible paperwork, like the whole thing about, I guess, like borders and things like that. But um, I kind of went back and forth on like the specifics of, you know, exactly where the city was, exactly where the family was. And then, you know, because the relationship to death changes a lot and, um, like it's not a really uh it's not a coincidence that um Mercy's family is like solidly Caribbean versus like Kimena, where she's half Caribbean and half Latin American, because I really wanted to explore the idea of, you know, the, these people in the new world for whom technically that was the end of the world. You know what I mean? Like people who are like descended of slaves, like people who are descended of the indigenous people in the Americas, but it's at the same time the more specific I got, I think it was the it sort of lost that sort of um, banalization that I was really, <laughs> that was just so funny. It's just, this, this could happen anywhere. It doesn't matter. It's just like, who are we? What are we doing? And um, with that in mind, it's just sort of like the sort of, I guess, like the anywhere USA kind of trope. That was really funny to me. But um, apart from that, I think when I first started it, I was thinking of this as possibly animated, but I think the more that I've uh, developed the story, I've become really enamored with the um, sort of surrealistically realistic um, kind of presentation, if that makes sense. Like, like I use Los Spookies as an example, because I think it's really, uh, I love the tone of it, where it was just, everyone sort of accepted that things were just really, really strange but it's never out of the ordinary. And it's just, you know, it's, a, how do I put this? It's a bit like those um, music videos from like 2006 where the CGI is really bad, but like we all just accept it. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like, it's, 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 I think it's like, um, it's like, I don't know. It's like a hyper realism kind of, if that makes sense. Okay. So yeah, that's what I think I was going for. All right. And any more questions? No. All right. I think we're good. So once again, congrats, Rachel. A round of applause again. YouTube putting the fire emojis and the applause. Yes, we're seeing you there as well. Um, big up yourself, Rachel. Yeah. So now let's move on to the other pitch. So introducing the other awardees, Tristan Allen and Adrian Campbell. Tristan Allen is a screenwriter whose passion is satirical and surreal comedies that explore themes of social and economic inequality and the absurdity, absurdity of everyday life. He successfully spun this passion into a desk job at the Jamaica Film Commission. <laughs> Along with co-writer Adrian Campbell, Tristan co-founded the Jamaican satirical blog, The Ungrateful Soup, 
wrote for local variety series C Death. Stage play Reassured and the comedy re review Pitchy Patchy. Tristan and Adrian are currently developing the sitcom Dippy about the deportee thrown into privileged world of uptown Jamaica. Adrian, Adrian Campbell, is a screenwriter who moonlights in advertising as a creative lead at the lab Jamaica. He has a passion for comedy, film, and themes of social justice. A co-founder of the Jamaica Satire blog, Ungrateful Soup with Tristan Allen, Adrian is also has also worked as a writer for TVJ's C Day. And for the non-Jamaicans, that's translated to There It Is. He is the co-creator and the co-writer of Dippy. So over to you, Tristan and Adrian. And good luck. Thanks, Said. Thank you, Said. All right. Hey guys, I'm Tristan Allen. I'm Adrian Campbell, and we're here to talk to you about our single camera half hour sitcom, Dippy. <laughs> Adrian and I met at Campion, which is like the Harvard of Jamaican high schools. A description any of the other high schools would hate to hear, so <laughs> please don't repeat that. <laughs> Campion is a place where different races and social classes across Jamaica come together and do not intersect. <laughs> we have a couple of friend groups where if I'm invited to get drinks or hang out, I immediately check if Tristan will be there to make sure I'm not the only black one in Jamaica. <laughs> yeah, our country's motto is out of many one people, but Jamaicans are very aware that contrary to popular belief, in no way are we all one people. <laughs> this open secret inspired us to write DP. Our comedy about the bizarre up universe of Uptown, a.k.a. privileged Jamaica. All right, so the logline. Dippy is a story of privileged college dropout and deportee Kwame Buchanan and his new local roommates who hate him. As they set out together to save his corrupt po parents' political careers so they can kick Kwame out of their one-bedroom flat. Dippy is like Arrested Development meets Atlanta. With dysfunctional family hijinks in a perplexing town where any wrong move could have dangerous consequences. We have a saying here that we take serious things make joke. The show is irreverent, a light treatment of dark topics with surreal elements that capture a new and nuanced perspective of life in Jamaica. So our main protagonist, Kwame, is broke and bougie, right? He's overly friendly and fully Americanized. While believing he's an authentic Jamaican man, the perpetual optimist, a side effect of his very privileged life, he treats every day like a vacation. Meanwhile, his cousin and new flatmates live in the hilariously high-stakes world of Kingston. So Kwame dropped out of NYU in his first year, but continued to collect tuition from his parents, two powerful Jamaican politicians, using the time and money to find himself and somehow become the next Steve Jobs. He didn't think that part through. Now that he's supposed to be graduating, it's the first time he's ever made his parents proud. So they're setting up a cushy first job for him in New York, except that he's in Jamaica, having been deported for violating his student visa. Kwame is afraid his parents could kill him. Or worse, write him out of the will. <laughs> So his plan is to hide it from his parents until he can somehow magically fix the situation. Luckily, he has a place to stay. The one-bedroom flat with his cousin Janelle, her weedhead boyfriend Magnum, and her weird best friend Dovecott. Who is ominously named for a local, after a local graveyard. <laughs> oh, and by the way, Kwame hasn't spoken to Janelle since he left Jamaica 10 years ago. Unbeknownst to Kwame, the privileged life he's trying to return to may no longer exist, as his, parent, as his perfect parents are embroiled in a scandal that may force him and the roommates he's dragging into this to do actual work to save the family and himself. We have a mantra here that Jamaica is not a real place. So intend to mind these aspects of Jamaican culture in literal and surreal ways, through the eyes and journey of Kwame, as he burdens his new roommates, starting with his cousin Janelle, who's the washed up superstar athlete turned accountant. So Janelle is a high functioning mess, a track star from an early age. Jan worked hard for her success. Unlike her privileged cousin. She was the it girl, the next big thing, uptown socialite levels. It went to her head. While celebrating a big win, she cartwheeled into a pirouette and tore her ACL on her landing. <laughs> The world moved on. 
Now she lives in a one-bedroom flat with her man and his best friend. She's still the same adrenaline junkie and brings a competitive drive to everything she does, except for her new accounting major. She's always resented Kwame for having everything handed to him. Him throwing it all away is the best news she's ever heard. Then there's her boyfriend, Magnum, the wise waste man. Like John, Magnum is in his final year, but leaving university and entering the real world is the worst thing that could ever happen to him. His goal is to live as a student for as long as he can. Magnum is a self-proclaimed like, simple country youth, right? He's very serious about the rules of a Jamaican man. You must play dominoes, watch football, meds and life with your bridge in them, and fuck you yeah. Just Jan now, by the way, she's the love of his life. <laughs> He's the zen, laid-back, perpetually high philosophy student who's achieved enlightenment through avoiding all responsibility. Magnum has no plans. His weed and chaff will guide him. And then we have Dovecott, the nerdy bad man. He's like 50 cents on the outside, but Gabby Douglas <laughs> on the inside. Dovecott came from humble beginnings and has an uncle who is affiliated with a violent gang, but he's not involved in any gang activity himself. His mother would actually kill him if she ever heard he was even pretending to be. He definitely uses the cachet to make himself look cool, though, when he's really an introverted art school nerd. Dovecott overthinks everything and is passionate about his few niche interests, anime, cricket, Modern dance, 90s dance hall, and of course, yeah. <laughs> His dream is to become a world-renowned dancer. He can dance. <laughs> then there's Kwame's uh, power couple parents, right? Titus Buchanan, the dirty politician with a clean image, and his wife, Victoria Buchanan, the ruthless former beauty queen turned press secretary. Titus is a cutthroat businessman who came from nothing which guides how he communicates with his disappointing son, Kwame, the eyelash in his eye. He's the upstanding minister of justice who's running for a seat on a platform of righteous leadership. While Victoria does the real work of managing his campaigns and communicating with his constituency. So Victoria is an ex-Miss Universe, and she's like a lifelike robot whose dial is turned to loving wife and caring mother never revealing her true feelings and often fantasizing about a version of herself, which she calls Vixie, who never married her naive husband or had their idiot son. Here's what you need to know about these two, right? Titus and Victoria both have dreams of becoming prime minister. So this is going to eventually pit them against each other. Right. But for now, they're acting as a team whose goal is to keep Kwame as far away from them as possible and survive their latest political scandal. And by the way, they love corruption. It's what keeps their relationship alive. When Titus proposed, he specifically chose a blood diamond. It turned Victoria on. You don't want to know how much money they stole when they conceived Kwame. <laughs> so in the pilot, we begin with Kwame already deported back to Jamaica and having snuck into the only place here that he's familiar with outside of his parents' home. An all-inclusive hotel. <laughs> Over a Zoom call in the laundry room that he set up to look like his New York apartment, he tries to trick his parents into sending him money so he can actually stay at this hotel that he snuck into. And how Stella got her groove back his way into an American tourist heart. So she can take him back to the States with her. Easy. <laughs> the answer from his parents, though, is no. Instead of money, they've set him up with a cushy job in New York that starts in a week. If he doesn't show, they'll know he got deported, right? The clock is ticking. <laughs> so after he gets thrown out of the hotel, Kwame shows up at his cousin's one-bedroom apartment in the ghetto. By the way, this is the ghetto to him. It's really just a regular student apartment in a middle-class suburb. This is where Janelle, Magnum, and Dovecott have just started cramming for the midterm exams they have in three hours. <laughs> Kwame is hoping they can use their hood connections to get him back to the States. Since they're poor and must therefore know some criminals. Kwame's back is against the wall, but he can sense that they're desperate too. In exchange, he promises them automatic A's with the help of a well-connected professor from his father's past. They take the deal, knowing they're not going to help him. They'll just kick him out after. <laughs> so leading his new friends in a place he barely knows, Kwame takes off down the yellow brick road. It's a short trip. <laughs> The crew finds the professor getting arrested on campus for his involvement in some 
corrupt political activities. As he gets taken away by the police, he implies that Kwame's parents could be involved. Jan turns on Kwame for wasting their time, and the two cousins get into a big fight where she calls his side of the family scammers, and he says she's just jealous because her track career is done and her life is off track, and she's stuck in a field that she hates. Jan reveals that the roommates never had connections to getting back to America anyway. He's stuck in Jamaica forever, and his parents are going to find out he's here if they don't already know. People start to hear the fight. Uptown people. <laughs> Kwame, afraid his parents could be in trouble, but even more afraid that they could soon hear about the deportation, sets off to find Mr. Obia, some guy that Magnum mentioned is his only hope. Obia, by the way, is actually a religious practice similar to voodoo, not some guy. <laughs> and that is exactly what Kwame finds. So he runs into this small cult of desperate students performing a ritual to conjure miracles to pass their exams. Or who knows, in Kwame's case, maybe reverse a deportation. <laughs> they literally have like a bonfire going in the middle of the classroom. Each person in this Obia ritual must sacrifice something to the fire and then drink from a magical elixir in order to get what they desire, or pass the exams. Someone gives up her grandma's ashes. It's serious. It is here that Kwame realizes that maybe he needs to be real for once in his life, and there's no getting back to the States. Instead, he decides to use a ritual to help his parents get out of whatever little hiccup this scandal might be. When they realize that he's the one who saved them, they'll welcome him back with open arms. So he throws his passport into the fire. <laughs> then he takes a swig of the liquid, almost drink to achieve their dreams, but yuck. Yeah. It's just cheap wine. He spits it out into the fire, which starts to spread, then exits the building. Kwame is lost. Students outside are glued to their phones, looking at a breaking news report about Kwame's parents, who allegedly tried to sell a whole parish. This is like a governor trying to sell Texas. <laughs> <laughs> These are the same perfect people who raised him. The students all turn to look at Kwame. Meanwhile, since Kwame didn't come through, Dovkat and Magnum are on a mission to prep for their exams with the hour and a half they have left. First up, a Xanax dealer on campus to help calm Dovkat's nerves. He studied, but he's terrible at taking tests and he's freaking out. Magnum, meanwhile, is barely present. He's spiraling from an offhand comment Kwame made earlier about him being a good boyfriend. <laughs> When they get to the dealer, he's out of Xanax, but playing on Delcat's anime obsession offers him sensu beans from Dragon Ball Z instead. He takes them. <laughs> then Jan joins them in a library with her favorite study, a bottle of wine. <laughs> and the three of them have an hour left now, but none of them can study because they're all pissed at Kwame. Magnum isn't the Gallus he thought he was, and Gallus is Jamaican for fuckboy. Jan yearns for her glory days. And that tripping dovecat discovers that the sensu beans he just took are actually shrews. <laughs> <laughs> so after escaping the students' prying eyes, Kwame realizes that, wait, the Obe was in him all along. <laughs> he decides to go face his parents and he even thinks he has a plan to save their campaign. Meanwhile, Magnum, Janel, and Dovecat, who are now passed out in the library, wake up smelling smoke. Kwame arrives at his parents' house. But it's ransacked and his parents are long gone. Fuck. Like, this is way worse than he thought it was. Now he really has nowhere to go. The last resort, he goes back to the apartment with his tail between his legs to beg for a place to stay. He's surprised to find him delighted on top of the world. Of course he can stay. He burned down a whole building. Exam postponed. Woo! Kwame is a hero. He has a place to stay. At least for tonight. <laughs> So over the six episode season, the group will attempt to save the parents' reputation to get Kwame out of the house. By the end, all the details of the scandal will come to light and Titus and Victoria will publicly disown their deportee son Kwame to save the election campaign. Kwame will now be stuck in the flat with them for good and the flatmates will be dragged into his uptown shenanigans all through their final year of college. The show will explore the patty bag test, which is a test of the acceptable shade of skin color to be included in uptown activities. Hence, it's not black. <laughs> it will also explore the minuscule uptown dating. 
the virus-like spread of bad mind, which is a Jamaican term for being envious of someone else's success. Whether or not you should bow to the love of your life, that's the term for cunnilingus, which is very much a taboo in Jamaica. <laughs> and passing classes without attending them. We'll also meet the roommate's needy landlady, Lisa, a 40-year-old divorcee trying to regain her youth by constantly being in her tenant's business and making herself part of the gang. And their neighbor, Grace, the born-again, newly reformed demon girl. In Jamaica, this is like a female football. <laughs> <laughs> so Grace always tries to minister to the group, but secretly longs for the day that winning souls for Jesus feels just as good as taking a girl, man. <laughs> Over the series, we'll see Kwame transform from a self-sabotaging -deport, self deportee to his own brand of corrupt politician. Janelle will fall in love with the high-stakes world of chartered accounting. Delta will become a dance legend in Japan, and Magnum will find happiness as a perpetual university student. So, why do we want to make the game? Uh, we think in a world hungry for diverse stories that usually portray people of color navigating white spaces, we're telling a story about social, economic, and class differences among Black people in a Black country. But really and truly, this is a fish out of water story, and we just want to make fun of uptown people. <laughs> <laughs> we're exploring the perception versus the reality of life in Jamaica. You know, where tourists come for the white sandy beaches that us locals get locked out of. <laughs> this is a sitcom about serious things like deportation and a drama about silly things like cunnilingus. All in one, like Jamaica. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. Round of applause for Tristan and Adrian and their project, Dippy. Great job, guys. Thanks. And now I'm opening the floor once again to questions from the judges. Uh, well, I'll jump in. Uh, how you plan to manage, just like, just curious, how you plan to manage language? Um, because, of course, you're telling a story in Jamaica, Jamaican characters dealing with very specific local stuff, but the themes are global. The audience should be global. Um, and I know I've had to de deal with that language barrier sometimes. So I'm just curious how you guys, and of course, how some uptown people might talk, or you know, people talk in all yeah. ranges of like, <laughs> cultures, mm -hmm. about the signing of Patwa. So yeah. I was curious <laughs> how you kind of keep the authenticity and find a middle ground so it doesn't, you know? Well, well the good thing is that the protagonist, Kwame, almost serves as a stand in for international audiences too. Because Kwame is quite Americanized, and even though he he's always overconfident and thinks he knows Jamaica, he doesn't know anything. And so he's constantly learning, and that includes the language. And that gives us an opportunity to explain certain Jamaican phrases or things or cultural aspects because he doesn't understand them. So he can kind of be the audience's POV into our culture. Right. Great. Do we have any more? All right. Oh, I'll ask another one. Sorry. Okay. Um, obviously, there's a level of like, I don't know if the word is absurd, it's comedy, but are there, are there any references for the types of shows like, I don't know, Flight of the Concords or um, any other type of shows that we may not have a Jamaican connection in terms of how the comedy is kind of like packaged, how they communicate, the kind of level of silliness, etc. Or oh, you yeah, said Atlanta. Right, right. right. Atlanta yeah. and Arista Early Development. Yeah. Arista Development is special in terms of the like comedic but intricate plot lines um, and, you know, just uh, uh, misunderstand, confusing misunderstandings that can happen. And in Atlanta, for those sort of absurdist elements where, you know, it feels like you're really transported to a new world because you may not have this understanding um, of Jamaica. And then story-wise, um, with the fish out of water, it's sort of like Schitt's Creek um, with that uh, rich person in a sort of, to them, uh, underdeveloped um, stage. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Storm. 
Uh, I didn't have any questions. It's been fun looking at the chat and seeing everyone engaging with the story. I thought it was really funny. And I'm a, I'm a big Campion fan, so it was good. To <laughs> Something that's so near and dear to me. But um, <laughs> yeah, I l- learned about Uptown and Campion and, and following all the questions and stuff in the chat has been really fun. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Yeah. All right, if that's it for questions and or comments. Now we move on to the judging. So judges in the Zoom, I was going to ask you to jump into our breakout room real quick. Um, Tech team, if you can just organize that. People on YouTube, just sit tight. We'll have some content for you to watch. Um, It's about mm, seven minutes. Hopefully the judges can make the decision quick. And then... We'll have the results for you as quickly as possible. So just sit tight. And thank you, everyone, again. Congrats to Rachel, Tristan. Sorry. Rachel, Tristan, and Adrian, again. And amazing projects, amazing pitches.
Jamaica 2022. Confirm. All right, cool. Slit. Scene two, take one. Mark. So you see, if you look on that right, right. so you see, so you open it properly. We're here shooting a small film. I'm a part time actor for today and I'm helping to direct, also helping with doing some photographs, some lighting, some all of that. So we're just here learning and it's been a great experience so far. It's been good so far. I'm learning something new, something that I didn't think that I would be learning. The most exciting part for me today is seeing the whole setup for the scenes. I would like to be an actor and this is going to give me a first hand experience of what it's going to be like to be on a set. The most exciting part for me today is to be an extra and it's been great. The scenes, the expressions, all of that, <laughs> I fell in love with it. Alright, stand by. I would just go to run through. So just remember, so when you walk up, you do your first film, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to show that you're doing something. What happened now is that the next time you make a film, you're supposed to see the marked improvement. Yeah. Every time you create something, it's supposed to elevate, you understand? It's been a good experience. I'm mean, about film production and all of the process it takes to make a film. And the person within the field that wants to train other young that are interested, so they'll be under good guidance and good leadership. I would like to thank Jeff for this tremendous experience and just meeting these awesome people and just having a great day. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here, to have such a lot of fun, meet some new, new friends, new people, and I hope you guys continue doing this wonderful job. Big, big ups to Jafta. Jafta and UNICEF, big up. Like, it's been, a, it's been a great opportunity for me personally, and I just want to tell anybody that's interested, to give it a go. I have to say I'm thankful to Jafta and the Spotlight Initiative for giving me the chance to experience today. I am Hanif James and I am the writer and director for A Shade of Indigo. So my name is Nadine Rawlins and I am the producer and director of Paralytic. Hi, my name is Gemma McFarlane. I'm the director of Time to Go, our Jasta Propeller short film. And lose that diffusion that you know. Outside of the fact that the story um, means a lot to me because of its theme of acceptance and, um, you know, not just the LGBTQ community, but all of us really who feel some form of oppression because of societal reasons. That's why this story means a lot to me and I just want uh, people to connect with the character that um, Melin has developed. Um, you know, humanizing people who have to go through these kind of struggles. My name is Melin Lowe and I'm the writer of Paralytic and also the art department. This story uh, came from a conversation I was eavesdropping on about 10 years ago. So it's based on a true crime actually that was never reported or solved. I am Carl Davis, and I play the bartender. Well, when we're doing film, you know you have to rehearse and get it checked. 
So you get the right stuff. I am Afi Abeni and my role is Scully. It's been very challenging to integrate into this character, but it also is exciting because I get to see a new part of me in a kind of way. Hi, my name is Afia Richards and I play the big sister Andine on A Shade of Indigo. I was very nervous because they had me, <laughs> they had a scene for me that I had to cry and I didn't know how I was going to go about doing that. But um, all in all, it was good. Um, everyone is fun, everyone's um, nice to be around. It's, it's awesome. I'm glad to be a part of this project. Hi, my name is Tanya Batson-Savage and I am the producer of A Shade of Indigo. From script, it's a beautiful story. The director had wonderful reasons for wanting to make this story and anyone who lives in contemporary Jamaica knows that this is, it's high time we spoke about this very important topic. Today's scene is one of the only VFX shots that we have. Uh, for most of the film, we're doing practical effects, choreography, whatever. So for this scene, our character has blanked out, and as such, what's represented in their mind is this beautiful white space. Hi, my name is Dane Nelson, and I am the DP for Time To Go. The idea is not necessarily to look like it's natural. It needs to look unreal, like she's, sur she's not really surrounded by white. You know, it started about three years ago, and so when we got the opportunity to to submit to JAFTA, it was like, you know, it was it, it was ready. Well, we were ready. We thought we were ready, but we weren't really ready <laughs> because we had to go through so much process in terms of getting the script ready, um, getting the work in general ready. The workshop process was amazing. I learned so much. A lot of workshopping went into this project. Of course, we did several rewrites and there were lots of discussions and I learned so much. I'm really grateful for it. The writing process is extensive and getting the writing done was something that was both explorative but also um, introspective. There were long sessions and there was a lot, lot lot of information that I have in a notebook that I'm pretty sure I will be consulting for a while yet to come. The exercise of creating the script and then you know going through it with the producers and trying to go through visuals and dialogue and everything was just a lot of work. Um, just getting involved with an association that has projects like you know Propeller um, because it's, you know, it's developmental and so I think it's so important once you, are, once you have made that decision to do filmmaking you know, to see the development that is required so that you can be better at what you do. I think this initiative is important because it helps to um, discover and showcase um, so many talented Jamaicans and so many talented individuals that are living here in Jamaica who ha are aware of their talent or yet to become aware of their talent. So I think it's important because they help to shed light on that. That's a wrap! <laughs>
for 2022. Scene two, take one, mark. So you see, they look on that right, right. so? You say so, we'll open it properly. Say, say. Say, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. We're here shooting a small film. I'm a part-time actor for today and I'm helping to direct, also helping with doing some photographs, some lighting, some all of that. So we're just here learning and it's been a great experience so far. It's been good so far. I'm learning something new, something that I didn't think that I would be learning. The most exciting part for me today is seeing the whole setup for the scenes. I would like to be an actor and this is going to give me a first hand experience of what it's going to be like to be on a set. The most exciting part for me today is to be an extra and it's been great. The scenes, the expressions, all of that, <laughs> I fell in love with it. Alright, stand by. I'm out, my old does got to go run through. So just remember, so when you walk up, when you do your first film, it doesn't have to be perfect. You just need to show that you're doing something. What happened now is that the next time you make a film, you're supposed to see the marked improvement. Every time you create something, it's supposed to elevate, you understand? It's been a good experience. I mean, about film production and all of the process it takes to make a film. And the person within the field that wants to train other young cells that are interested, so they'll be under good guidance and good leadership. I would like to thank Jeff for this tremendous experience and just meeting these awesome people and just having a great day. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity to be here, to have such a lot of fun, meet some new, new friends, new people, and I hope you guys continue doing this wonderful job. Big, big ups to Jafta. Jafta and UNICEF, big up. Like, it's been, a, it's been a great opportunity for me personally, and I just want to tell anybody that's interested, to give it a go. I have to say I'm thankful to Jafta and the Spotlight Initiative for giving me the chance to experience today. I am Hanif James and I am the writer and director for A Shade of Indigo. So my name is Nadine Rawlins and I am the producer and director of Paralytic. Hi, my name is Gemma McFarlane. I'm the director of Time to Go, a Just a Propeller short film. I lose that diffusion that you know. Outside of the fact that the story um, means a lot to me because of its theme of acceptance and, um, you know, not just the LGBTQ community, but all of us really who feel some form of oppression because of societal reasons. That's why this story means a lot to me and I just want uh, people to connect with the character that um, Malin has developed. Um, you know, humanizing people who have to go through these kind of struggles. My name is Malin Lowe and I'm the writer of Paralytic and also the art department. This story uh, came from a conversation I was eavesdropping on about 10 years ago. So it's based on a true crime actually that was never reported or solved. I am Carl Davis and I play the bartender.
All right. Back again. Anybody who gone drink tea or gone eat food or whatever you gone to do, come, we, we reach back. So we're back again and we're about to announce. However, right before we announce who the winner is, I uh, just want to introduce Judalina Nira and Kevin Avery, our mentors for this uh, for this initiative. And guys, if you have any remarks, we'd love to hear them. Thank you. First off, I want to start by saying thank you so much to Aisha, who has uh, become a dear friend in addition to being uh, a two-time co-worker. Uh, we're just holding out for number three. We just got to land on a third show together. Uh, this was such a special opportunity. So thank you so much. And I mentor a lot and read a lot. And as an EP on a genre show, um, I am... I was really impressed just right off the jump with the the caliber and the quality of the material for Tristan, Adrian and Rachel. And uh, specifically, Rachel, I just have to sing your praises because your voice just jumped off the page immediately to me. I am a genre junkie through and through. And the tone, the irreverence, the drawl nature of your, your script, along with uh, the specific and just really human characters, uh, impressed me right from the jump. And it's been a true pleasure continuing to work on them with you. Um, guys, we just adore you and are so proud and impressed of the amazing work and this these spectacular pitches. Uh, everybody's a winner in my book, and I'm so glad to know you and to continue to have you in my lives. Uh, yeah, I just echo what Judalina said, and you know, thank you, Aisha, for um, uh, you know involving me in this. this. Has been an amazing process, um, and you know, uh, congrats to all you guys. Uh, you know, uh, Adrian, Tristan, Rachel, for doing an amazing job. Um, you know, writing a pilot is hard, pitching is hard, um, all the stuff that comes in between is hard, and you know. I think we all know it can take, it could be a slog and it could take a long time to see the three of you do all this in a short amount of time and really put in the work and, and show the talent. It's just, it's been uh, really exciting to watch and I've enjoyed working with you guys. Um, so again, you know, congratulations to all of you because uh, I, I really was impressed with what I saw here today and through the whole process, I've been impressed with you all. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Jalalina and Kevin. And a big round of applause to the awardees. Big round of applause to Jafta. Thank you, judges. And most important, most importantly, big round of applause to Aisha. Big up yourself, Aisha, for this initiative. So now is the time. And I, I'm not going to make this like nerve wracking. So I'm not going to be the one who announces this. However, I'd like to throw to Storm to make this very special announcement of the winner of the big pitch. And hold on, just to remind you, the winner gets 8,000 US, USD. However, both awardees get the opportunity to meet with execs for these major, major projects. So on to you, Storm. Yeah, respect. Thank you very much. So look, we have a short amount of time, so I'm gonna try my best to kind of put in uh, um, what we've been discussing behind the scenes um, uh, before making this announcement. So I will say, first of all, and I, I, we will have the opportunity to read these scripts and give individual like specific notes that we can really get into the nitty gritty of things. So that will happen. We can't, of course, say all of the notes now. Personally, you know, I want to see both of these shows i could see the writers in them you know rachel i could see you and hearing visions from your young and like i can feel you in the work same thing um you know i love that specificity um and obviously there's a passion that's gonna come with that you, you know um same with adrian and tristan obviously living in jamaica we know kind of <laughs> we know the little strangeness the bizarro world as you put it which is quite accurate and sometimes the best way to kind of look at um strange societal things is through humor and that's really exciting um i feel like uh what else to say i feel like one thing is like you know at first as i was listening to the pitches i thought you know maybe 
having projects that are more broad and less culturally specific might be a good thing. But then going through the process, I realized that being even more culturally specific is actually an advantage in this, in this time. You know what I mean? Um, because filmmaking is about discovery and all of that. Um, and we want new stories. Um, well, okay. What else can I say before I announce it? Uh, <laughs> so, look, uh, we love this. I wish you guys could have heard kind of the conversations behind the scenes. Um, I think both pitches were strong, but right out the gate, I could kind of, one of the stories I could, we could kind of understand very quickly immediately who the characters were, where they were going, um, could kind of see the show right away. Um, I think, okay, so let me just announce it. The winner is Dippy, <laughs> right? The winner is gonna is Dippy. Um, and, uh, and, but they were both so strong, you know? I would say one of the reasons for the, for the, for the win, Dippy, is that we could, it was very clear from Jump Street who we were following. Um, the characters are really well carved. Um, and, and it was very, very clear. It's, it's present day, it's modern. You, you don't have to build a new world. You're kind of dropping into the world. I will say this, you know, Rachel, with your project, it's, it's, it's so fresh and original. And I think perhaps pitching it in this format might be a little bit um, difficult because you do have to like build the world. And your project could probably do well with ha creating a proof of concept you know, whether it's a short or something like that, that helps us kind of explain the space that our characters live in. So then it makes the pitch a lot easier. So we kind of feel like that would be a, a great thing for you to pursue. I think, as we said, uh, you're gonna get specific notes on these scripts to help keep building them out, keep um, working on them, because they're both really amazing, worthy shows that should be out there. So um, congratulations to all of you guys, big up um, to Dip, to dip you on taking this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's, what, that's all we got to say for that. Um, so, congratulations again. Yeah, respect, Storm. Yeah, that was definitely a hard job. I couldn't have done that. Um, <laughs> big, big, up to you, big up to the winners, Dippy. Um, I was going to open the floor to Rachel first and then to Dippy. Rachel, if, if you have anything you want to say, any thank you or anything. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was like, what do, what do I do with the floor exactly? <laughs> okay. um, this is, I I know I'm supposed to be allegedly a writer, but this is, you know, I really don't have a, a good vocabulary to explain what this experience has been like. Um, uh, I think just like off, uh, above everything else, I mean, to be taken seriously means a lot, uh, especially at this stage in, you know, um, I guess like what one's career or in, I guess, as a filmmaker, as a writer, it, to have a voice and to put it on the page, it's awful. <laughs> it's a terrible process. And to have people who see that and recognize that, but, you know, can also make things feel possible and to really honor the, what it is that you're trying to say, and rather than, you know, I think really to sort of move you beyond into something that is really so outside of um, the message, the, the process, the relationship that you have to working um you know I've never been in a program like this which is uh like with this level of intensity and like this level of attention and it's really you know it's changed the way that I think about like, myself as a writer but it's also you know being having relationships with people who are just so generous and so um interested and so thoughtful and um you know, supportive, uh, like Judelina, especially, you know, it's been such a journey. Aisha, Kevin, I really can't, I really, I don't know why you put me on the floor like this. Because <laughs> it's just like uh, in front of this, the, this public that I can't even see because it's like, well, I would, I'd like to do my crying behind closed doors, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's just like, it's, 
it's like a deeply humbling um, position to be in. And I really, I really can't overstate how much I appreciate all, all of this. Thank you. Thank you so <laughs> we're very genuine and authentic. We, we definitely appreciate you saying that. And then on to the winners, Dippy, Tristan and Adrian. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks, Said. First of all, a big, massive thank you to this whole process, to everyone involved, starting with Aisha, putting this together, giving us what feels like and what is a real opportunity. You know, we yeah. have, I'm sure Rachel can relate. We've been at this for a while, you know, kind of with the hope, the distant hope that it will somehow become something. And this feels like like something. So I, I truly appreciate that. Kevin, your notes, just the sessions just have been wonderful. Um, getting us to see a different perspective on what we've written, joking around together as we develop um, the work. Um, I felt like we're in our writer's room. Exactly. Like after, you know, it was, <laughs> we're like, oh, this is the real deal. This is awesome. <laughs> And Judalina as well, just like being, uh, as Rachel said, generous, generous with your time, with your notes, really feeling like um, effort is being put in to support us in a real way. And that that's just been wonderful. Storm, Kia, the judges, um, you know, we're looking forward to um, connecting. <laughs> yeah, even more. <laughs> Um, Scott and Cecile and Rukaya, thank you for your time. Um, thank you for your energy. I know it's a Sunday, <laughs> um, but this this really has been a, a, a great process. So we're very thankful. Yeah, I want to echo everything Tristan said. Like it's, it really feels like a blessing. And as I said, like we've been working on on this show and other shows, but like this is the first. This is kind of our baby. It's the first one we started writing together years ago. Um, and so it's like this whole process has been very, very rewarding and very educational, as was said. And we hope we still, you know, we'll get to work in some way, continue to work with Kevin and Judalina and Aisha um, in the future. Because like, yeah, once you get a taste of this, like you, <laughs> you just need more. And also, Rachel, like, uh, like we would like hope that they, like. Jamaica has writers' rooms that this becomes a thing um, and it's just like the beginning of the industry. Like, thank you. Thank you very much, Aisha and Jafta. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Big up for yourself. And that's basically, that's a wrap. So thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you for all the judges. Thank you to all the judges. Thank you for to the mentors. Thank you for the YouTube audience. You have been very engaging. The enough emojis are there and it will be up on YouTube so you guys can check it out at a later date. And that's a wrap. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Big up. Yes. <laughs>
So it's based on a true crime, actually, that was never reported or solved. I am Carl Davis, and I play the bartender. Well, when we're doing film, you know you have to rehearse and get it checked so you get the right stuff. I am Afi Abeni and my role is Scully. It's been very challenging to integrate into this character, but it also is exciting because I get to see a new part of me in a kind of way. Hi, my name is Afia Richards and I play the big sister Andine on A Shade of Indigo. I was very nervous because they had me <laughs> they had a scene for me that I had to cry and I didn't know how I was going to go about doing that but um, all in all it was good um, everyone is fun everyone's um, nice to be around it's it's awesome I'm glad to be a part of this project hi my name is Tanya Batson Savage and I am the producer of a shade of indigo from script it's a beautiful story the director had wonderful reasons for wanting to make this story and anyone who lives in contemporary Jamaica knows that this is it's high time we spoke about this very important topic. Today's scene is one of the only VFX shots that we have. Uh, for most of the film we're doing practical effects, choreography, whatever. So for this scene our character has blanked out and as such what's represented in their mind is this beautiful white space. Hi, my name is Dane Nelson and I am the DP for Time To Go. The idea is not necessarily to look like it's natural. It needs to look unreal, like she's, sur she's not really surrounded by white. You know, it started about three years ago and so when we got the opportunity to to submit to JAFTA, it was like, you know, it was, it, it was ready. Well, we were ready, we thought we were ready, but we weren't really ready. <laughs> because we had to go through so much process in terms of getting the script ready, um, getting the work in general ready. The workshop process was amazing. I learned so much. A lot of workshopping went into this project. Of course, we did several rewrites and there were lots of discussions and I learned so much. I'm really grateful for it. The writing process is extensive and getting the writing done was something that was both explorative but also um, introspective. There were long sessions and there was a lot, lot, lot of information that I have in a notebook that I'm pretty sure I will be consulting for a while yet to come. The exercise of creating the script and then, you know, going through it with the producers and trying to go through visuals and dialogue and everything was just a lot of work. Um, just getting involved with an association that has projects like, you know, Propeller, um, because it's, you know, it's developmental and so I think it's so important once you are, once you've made that decision to do filmmaking, you know, to see the development that is required so that you can be better at what you do. I think this initiative is important because it helps to um, discover and showcase um, so many talented Jamaicans and so many talented individuals that are living here in Jamaica who ha are aware of their talent or yet to become aware of their talent. So I think it's important because they help to shed light on that. That's a wrap! <laughs>